Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, following the Spanish arrival in the New World and their conquest of the Aztec Empire starting in 1519, the Spanish destroyed a temple of the main mother goddess at Tepeyac outside of Mexico City and built a chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary. But that was just the beginning of centuries of Catholic influence on the region and on the church. And December 9th and December 12th are now the feast days of Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe because of the extraordinary events that happened on those days. We are On December 9, 1531, shortly after the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in Europe, Juan Diego, a pleasant peasant, was going to the chapel and past Tepeyac Hill in modern-day Mexico City, as we said. There, Mary appeared to him, and in his native language, she said she was his mother, and she wanted a church built there and for him to go tell the bishop of her request. Juan Diego asked Mary if she could send someone else because of his inadequacies, but she replied, there are many I could send, but you are the one I have chosen. So Mary told him to go back to the bishop the next day. And when he did, the bishop asked for a sign as proof of the claim's authenticity, since he was skeptical, but at the same time intrigued. Reporting this to Mary, Our Lady said that she would give the bishop a sign, and to Diego he was to return again the next day. However, Diego did not return for two more days because his uncle became ill, and he went to find a priest. Now, trying to avoid the lady, he tried to go another route around the hill, but Mary saw him. You know, can you imagine trying to hide or run from your own mother? I learned long ago, you cannot do that. <clears throat> so once Mary saw Juan Diego, she said to him, your uncle will be fine. There is no need for a priest. Go to the top of the hill and cut the flowers there and bring them to me. Now it was freezing, and those kinds of roses were not native to Mexico, but he did as he was told. Then, on December the 12th, Diego met the bishop, opened his tilma, which was the overcoat made of cactus material, and bright roses fell out. And on the tilma was an image left of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, the bishop fell to his knees and thanked the Virgin for answering his request. Juan Diego was thankful too, as his uncle was cured. And interestingly, he told Juan that he too had met a woman clothed in light. She told him to call her Santa Maria de Guadalupe. And this, you know, could may have meant uh, different things. Cotla Lope, which means one who treads on snakes, or it could have even have referred to Our Lady of Guadalupe in Spain. Hernan Cortes, uh, the conquistador who overthrew the Aztec Empire in 1521, was native. He was a native of Extremadura, the home of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Now, either way, within six years, Six million Aztecs had converted to Catholicism, and over a quarter of a million people a year were saved from human sacrifice. That is why Our Lady of Guadalupe is now known as the Protectress of Life. Now, let's go back to the miraculous tilma left by Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, the tilma is made of this fibrous material, uh, which should have lasted only about 30 years, but is now almost 500 years old and still in amazing condition. It's three and a half feet by six and a half feet, with the back side being really rough, very coarse, but the front side is smooth, uh, smooth like silk. And the image on the tilma shows Mary as the God bearer, adorned in Aztec attire, which Mary always appears in the 
uh, the cultural attire when she does appear. It's amazing. And she was pregnant with her divine son. We know this because to the natives, the belt was a sign of pregnancy. So Mary was pregnant on December the 9th for the upcoming December the 25th birth of our Lord. You know, this connects to the book of Revelation. When the woman gives birth to the one who will reign over all the nations, the Bible says she is clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is what we see on the Guadalupe image. And it is not just about her crown of stars, but the stars also on the image are significant. You know, there are 22 stars on the right and 26 stars on the left, which actually show the constellations that were in the sky on December the 12th, 1531. Amazing. And in one of the most incredible aspects to me, a scientist in Mexico discovered that when the position of the stars on the Tilma were laid out and graphed, it appeared that they were in the position of musical notes. And when those notes were composed and put to music and played, the music was heavenly and angelic. You know, in addition to all of this, the physical properties of the tilma are miraculous as well. The original artwork has neither cracked nor flaked, um, while later additions, such as the gold leaf, the silver plating, the moon, etc., they have shown serious signs of wear, if not completely deteriorated. And Dr. Philip Cerna Callahan, who actually photographed the icon under infrared light, declared that portions of the face, hands, robe, and Mary's mantle had been painted in one step with no sketches, no corrections, no visible brush strokes. This is amazing, yet experts cannot find any paint on the image. Um, and incredibly, the color is not of the color spectrum known to man, uh, meaning it's its own unique color, completely unknown. And these color fibers, these uh, colors actually, they float one one hundredth of an inch above the fiber. They are not soaked into it. They're not soaked into the material as it would be if it were a painting. Um, then there is the, the, the miracle or the miraculous eyes, okay, of the image, Mary's eyes. In the reflection of Our Lady's eyes, images of all the people present when the tilma was first revealed before the bishop in 1531 can be seen. And you know, some even claim that heartbeats can be detected when a stethoscope is held up to the womb of Mary on the image, but that has never been fully verified. But what we can say for sure, however, is that this is an image of a great woman joined in prayer of supplication, right? Therefore, she is not a goddess as she is praying to someone greater than her, a god. Uh, but she is powerful because she's blocking out the sun behind her. So she's greater and brighter than the sun or the sun god of the Aztecs. So it's not only miraculous in its meaning, but it's also miraculous in its physical characteristics. Why? Because it has survived over centuries. It has survived smoke from fires and candles, water from floods and torrential downpours. And in fact, even in 1921, a bomb exploded near it, but didn't hurt the image. That is why in 1977, the tilma was examined using infrared photography and digital enhancement to determine how it was even created. But interestingly, it shows no sketching of any sign of outline drawn on it to permit an artist to paint it. Um, the testing was unable to explain any of this. It's a longevity or even the method by how it was made. So again, amazing. Today, it is housed in the Basilica at Guadalupe, 
the most visited Catholic site of all, and the third most visited sacred site in the world. And remember, Our Lady of Guadalupe is also known as the protectress of unborn children, as described by John Paul II. So let's pray for her protection of human life. Now, speaking of human life, let's hear a very touching story about a mom's peace. This is a special group that provides funeral services and consolation to those families who have experienced a miscarriage. In 2014, Cara Palladino was anticipating the birth of her seventh child. She and her husband were at a routine ultrasound appointment at their hospital in Fairfax, Virginia. They chose the hospital because of its well-known and respected maternity program for families. They were excited about welcoming their baby into the world. But Kara's worst nightmare was about to come true. During the ultrasound, she and her husband learned that their baby, Francis Josephine, had died. I prayed my entire life that God would not ask me to bury a baby. This is a different kind of grief. This is mourning my unborn child that I didn't get to know anything about. I had six children at home. I had complicated pregnancies, but all of my babies lived. We were invested in that pregnancy from the moment we learned that we were pregnant, and now all of a sudden, the baby is gone. Hospitals, funeral homes, and cemeteries had a good handle on infant loss, but burial plans for miscarried or stillborn babies were not available. So Kara and her husband, strong in their Catholic faith, were left with the burden of how they would provide a proper burial for their baby and heal from the intense grief. I wanted something more intimate, something that was of our faith, and so I called the church because I was just sure that the church had a plan for this um, and found out that they did not. Too often when a mother finds out that she has lost her baby, there is not a support system in place for her. She doesn't know what to do. It was at that point, Kara realized that God was asking her to serve him by advocating for women just like her. Through me, God started a mom's peace an apostolate for mothers of miscarried and stillborn babies. Colleen Sullivan and her husband have been blessed with three happy, healthy children, but unfortunately, they have had to endure the pain of miscarriage five times. A mom's peace was a critical safety net of support during those dark days. I was in shock and disbelief. The next question was, what do I do next? Who do I call and where do I lay my child's remains to rest? I placed a phone call to a mom's piece. Someone had told me about this wonderful organization that would help you in the wake of a loss. There were churches that couldn't help me. There were cemeteries who weren't available to offer me a tiny plot for my child. Kara has held me through tears and um, losing children. She has got down on her hands and knees and uh, dug one of my baby's graves with me in the dead heat of August. <laughs> For someone to humble themselves and bring themselves to your feet at your darkest hour is, um, there's a connection there that is hard to articulate. Considering we've done, have done a lot with online and Zooming, if there's a way to live stream it, we can- After Colleen lost her fifth baby, Kara asked her to use her communications background to assist a mom's piece in helping other women just like her. God just opened doors for us, one at a time at the perfect pace where she invited me to come along and help, and I'm eternally grateful. Hi, ladies. Kelsey. Kara and Colleen are among many parents who have answered yes to the call of giving back after losing a child. Volunteers include people who make beautiful flower arrangements. God bless you, I'll see you soon. Take care. Handcraft caskets, sew blankets, and make layettes that babies are laid to rest in. A mom's piece also has a volunteer who coordinates a very critical part of their online presence. 
We have a Garden of Remembrance where people all over the world can honor their child lost in miscarriage or stillbirth by sharing their name, picking out a flower for them, and um, having a place to honor them. Okay, so you're good? You know what yeah. you're doing? Yeah. Since losing Francis Josephine, Kara and her family endured the heartbreak of losing three other children to miscarriage. Each loss was just as devastating, but they had the love and support of a mom's piece, reminding them that they were not alone. We want mothers and families who have experienced miscarriage to be able to know this is not the end story. This is not the last word. God's love is. Kara estimates that through loving guidance, a mom's peace has helped over 2,000 families navigate the pain of losing a child. But she gives the glory to God. None of this would be possible without Him. I'm not doing this, so all I have to do is show up. <laughs> the Lord does all of this. My reward is not here. My reward is in heaven. And I know that um, the only way that I will see uh, my babies again and meet the babies that we have served is to get up every day and do what God is asking of me. I had no choice in this but to trust in the Lord that he, he was going to make something come of this. If the Lord asks something of you, just show up. He will take your sorrow he will take your crosses. He will turn them into redemptive suffering. And, and he will do it all for the glory of God through you if you show up. When we bury the dead, it helps to bring people to life because they know that, okay, there's more to this story. There's another chapter, right? When we help counsel the doubtful, when they're doubting like, okay, is, does anybody care about my child? When we show up there, there's a profound yes. What a moving piece about a great group of people who help these mothers going through a difficult time. You know, Mary is our ultimate mother. So let us hear now in scripture from Father Matthew Tomini about the time Mary learned she was to be the mother of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. At the Annunciation, Mary receives the Christ child into the world. Through her unconditional yes, fiat, to God, the divine plan for our salvation takes shape. Because of Mary's fiat, St. Bernard of Claveau calls her the aqueduct of all the graces of God to human hearts. He writes, Receiving the fullness of the fountain from the Father's heart, 
Mary has passed it on to us, at least insofar as we can contain it. He praises Mary for the fervor of her devotion and the purity of her prayer. We can trust in Mary's prayers for us and imitate her devotion. St. Bernard prays, Mother of life, Mother of our salvation, through you let us have access to your Son, so that through you he may receive us, he who was given to us through you. He adds, Such is the will of God, who would have us obtain everything through her hands. Let us then ask Mary for the grace to say yes to God. Well, thank you, Father Matthew. Now let's hear about one of the most beautiful yet somber places here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, the Shrine of Holy Innocence, as Father Anthony explains to you the importance of remembering our children. Well, the idea was uh, actually went back to 2007. We were doing Rachel's Vineyard retreats here, and then we were building the outdoor shrine in 2008. And the idea actually came when I was given a tour to one of the Rachel's Vineyard retreatants. Uh, she had this idea of having memorials for uh, her children, for unborn children. First of all, it was going to be for unborn children, and then we decided to expand it to anyone that ever lost a child. And then we put the idea together in the Shrine of the Holy Innocence, where we put a lot of um, lighted dynamics that involve all the senses to help both men and women to heal from a loss of a child. And so we expand it to not only unborn children, but to miscarriages, to stillborns, to people that have lost babies uh, outside the womb, people that have lost children, parents that have lost children, or relatives that are grieving. So it's, it's really a, a shrine to help people to find hope, to find healing, to also have their child's name put on a plaque there, and, um, and to surrender you know, themselves and their grief to the Lord. So one thing, one item that uh, pilgrims would notice when they come into the Shrine of the Holy Innocence is we have Our Lady Guadalupe in the center of the shrine. And that was on purpose when we had the idea of the Shrine of the Holy Innocence when I was taking this retreat around. We were actually in the Marian Helper Center Oratory and she saw Our Lady Guadalupe and then she saw these memorial names and that's where she said, why don't you have memorials for our children? So that was kind of an inspiration that actually came from the Marian Helper Center Oratory to have Our Lady Guadalupe in the center. But we want Our Lady Guadalupe in the center because she's the patroness of life. And on the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, there's a sash, there's like a black sash that comes down. And actually the Native American women at that time would wear a belt when they would get pregnant they would wear a belt and then as their belly would grow in the pregnancy the belt would go higher and higher and higher and so on our lady guadalupe you can't see the belt because it's so high that means she's in the ninth month of pregnancy with the child jesus and then there's a little flower that's right over her womb that flower is called the nawi olin and was the most sacred flower uh, to the, the Native Americans that, that they know this is a truth, beauty, universe. And so having that flower right over her womb was very significant for the conversion of the Native American people to show that she was pregnant, that she was bringing in the king of the universe, the king of the world, Jesus Christ coming into the world. And so Our Lady Guadalupe is empathizing with men and women who are coming in with a child loss because she has a child in her womb, she's showing that she is pregnant and she is with them and that she is with all these children that are around her. So you'll notice that the names of the children are all around Our Lady. And it's kind of like they're, they're in her womb, that, that the Shrine of the Holy Innocence is like a secret womb. It's a haven for these children and for the parents and for the, the family members that come and visit this beautiful shrine. Thank you. 
Before Holy Communion, I saw the Blessed Mother, inconceivably beautiful. Smiling at me, she said to me, My daughter, at God's command, I am to be, in a special and exclusive way, your mother. But I desire that you too, in a special way, be my child. O Mary, my mother and my lady, I offer you my soul, my body, my life, and my death, and all that will follow it. I place everything in your hands. O my mother, cover my soul with your virginal mantle, and grant me the grace of purity of heart, soul, and body. Defend me with your power against all enemies, and especially against those who hide their malice behind the mask of virtue. O lovely lily, you are for me a mirror, O my mother. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us this week. And speaking of the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we Marian Fathers hand make these canvas images right here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. So you can now get an image for your own home or as a gift for someone else. The information is there on your screen, so please visit divinemercyart.org and bring Our Lady of Guadalupe home. And please join us next week as we talk about Christmas traditions like Christmas tree and Santa Claus and how they really came to be based on our faith. And until then, may Almighty God bless you and yours in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.